Okay. So I'll start off first. First of all, I wanted to welcome everybody um, to the program. I really appreciate everybody coming here tonight. Tonight is a uh, busy night, Sunday night. Um, since nobody's going back to work, it's not such a big deal. But there's a lot of programs tonight. I really appreciate everybody tuning in. This is our sixth show. And it uh, keeps on getting better and better. We're getting a tremendous amount of requests. And we're trying to keep up with everybody. I want to start first with uh, thanking all our corporate sponsors. First, our first corporate sponsor tonight, uh, Peace Capital, Mr. Shalom Stein, for sponsoring tonight's program. We really appreciate it. I want to give special thanks to Mrs. Chaya, Ka Chaya LeCalfin from the Ated Matzah for sponsoring us and putting us out there. I want to give a big shout out to Lakewood News Network, LNN, Lakewood's most viewed status. And I also want to give a thank to Mr. Hasenfeld from Lakewood School for sponsoring us and getting us out there. Um, again, tonight's an interactive program. We want it to be enjoyable. Please try to chime in. We're going to start with uh, Coach Menachem. I'm going to refer to him as Coach Menachem. It's a little confusing tonight because we have Menachem Berenfeld, who's Coach Menachem, and then we have Menachem Friedman, so who I'm going to refer to him as Mr. Friedman, Coach Menachem, and then we have Matis Miller, who's also decided to join us tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, so Menachem, you'll start, and then when you're done, shoot it back to me, okay? Everybody ready? Okay, first I want to welcome all of you and thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, before I start, I just want everyone to move up closer. There's a lot of seats over here in front and I see a lot of people are trying to get into the virtual room. So you can, I see there's a lot of people up front to open their videos and I invite all of you to open the videos and to be interactive and to be part of it. By the way, if you want to experience a little a little bit of anxiety maybe you can try to open your video see how you feel then i would like to thank all of those like usher said the sponsors the sponsor from stein and everyone who is involved in this it's unbelievable how the whole staff everybody who is involved they work around the clock to make this happen and um I'm really grateful to be a part of this platform. Just seeing all the positive feedback from all of you listeners, how much you enjoy it, and everybody's asking for the replays, and when is the next show. It's just really, really amazing to see the positive feedback. And the phone calls that we get from the professionals, are they reaching out to help in any way, which is really amazing. So I really, really feel fortunate to be a part of this Chesed program. So tonight's topic, coping strategies for OCD and anxiety during and after the pandemic. So for many people in today's trying times, because of what's going on and a lot of negativity and things are just on hold for many people, life just stopped and it's just out of the norm. So what we need is a little bit of physic, like what we do in this program, like every week, week, every week, some a different topic, we discuss different ideas that can help in this not norm situation. Whether it's uh, having a gratitude journal, thanking Hashem, counting your blessings, and overall, making sure that your input, the information that you put in, is more positive than the negative. Well, you can call the Betachen hotline, which is very good, just so that you affirm again and again that there is someone running the world from A to Z and everything is with a precise, precisely the way it needs to be. So again, we could be mechazig asal, we're mechazig amun and betachim, everybody in their way, whatever works, so we can continue and do what we have to do. And hopefully we'll see the issue of the karev, everyone in their unique situation. However, there are people out there who, when they hear me saying all of these words of physic and all these nice ideas, they would run off the show. They would not stay here because it just does not help. And not only it doesn't help, when they hear this, it makes it even worse. And you can't just tell them, stop it. It's like that famous therapist, but the lady was scared that she, um, she was always worried someone's going to bury her alive in a box. So the therapist just told her, stop it. It doesn't work by just saying, stop it. And this is a very important awareness to know 
when we're discussing OCD and anxiety, whether it's a spouse, a child, a friend, whoever, whatever it is, if somebody is suffering from this and they come to you, very important to understand that you don't really understand. And it's not something you can tell them, I understand what you're going through. And especially if you have never experienced it yourself, it's something that we really can't understand. So the question is what you could do. So what you could do as a coach, or I can tell you, is just be there and listen. Because there's nothing you can tell them. But I'm very excited to have tonight on the platform Matas Miller and Menachem, Menachem Friedman, who can tell us a little bit more, give us a little bit more insights, and show us that even for those people that feel they're in the darkest places and they're having a hard time, especially in today's what's going on in the world, there are ideas and like, there are there is some hope and hopefully we'll get a little bit from tonight and amidst Hashem, you'll be able to pick up uh, some strategies that will help you get out and amidst Hashem, you'll be able to tell your story amidst Hashem. Thank you very much, Menachem. Beautiful. Really appreciate it. Uh, before we go on, I just want to give a few thank you, especially to a few people I was thinking about today. I wanted to give a special thank you to Ernayach Fried, who really, really launched this, to be quite honest with you. He was the one who, in the neighborhood, said, Lushi, we got to do something. We got to get some chizik when the things were getting started. And he was the one who pushed the whole time. And he's really uh, the driving force behind us. with the say, to him. And uh, before I, we move on to the next part of the program, I'm going to do it a little interesting tonight. We're going to try... Um, we have two therapists tonight, and they work together. And I actually want to introduce both of them together. We have Menachem Friedman, who lives in Hearthstone, who is uh, actually I know him for many, many years. And, you know, he works together with Matis Miller. Matis I happen to be uh, known for many, many years. And uh, to be quite honest, Matis has helped many, many people in tough situations. Um, I actually had uh, issues with Matis when I dealt with him, and he helped me personally. And I want to give a personal thank you to Matis for when I needed him in a time of crisis, he was there for me, and he really, really came through. His professionalism, his dedication is, um, un, un, I don't even know the right word. So that's a personal thank you to him. And uh, can I get back my money now? No. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he really is, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say it, uh, it the way it is. He, in Lakewood, is considered the expert in anxiety, period. Um, anybody who's going through anxiety doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean that you belong in the hospital. It means that you're going through a hard time in life. And right now, a lot of people are going through tremendous hard times in life, financially, emotionally, uh, health-wise. And um, the reason why I really, I personally reached out to Matis. I was like, Matis, I am getting requests. I'm having anxiety. I'm having stress. I don't know how to deal with it, whether it comes from the kids, whether it comes to that. And I, I sent him an email. I reached out to Menachem, who's a friend of mine. I said, please get Matis on the program. And Matis, the chesed, said, yes, I'm going to do it. I want to help out. And he came on the program, and we're all extremely grateful that he came on. And he's here to really answer our questions. Uh, you know, everybody's having different types of stresses. There are people, I'm going to have to admit, there are people that are living it up. There are people that are enjoying spending time with their family, and they love the whole situation. But uh, most of us are going through extreme anxieties, and it's normal. And that's why we're here to discuss how to deal with it, some tips. And um, I'm gonna, first, we're going to start with Menachem, uh, Mr. Friedman. I'd like him to start with a few words. Maybe we'll take one or two questions. Tonight, we're going to try to do a live poll to see where everybody on this program is holding. So we can get a little bit more awareness if that works out. We'll see if it works. It doesn't crash on us. Um, so Menachem, Mr. Friedman, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Usher. First of all, thanks a million um, for putting this together and for being so tenacious and making it happen. Um, and I'm not afraid to shout out to my classmate from when we were in elementary school. Um, so I really appreciate uh, you guys having us on. Uh, somebody asked me today, how did you make it onto this platform? And the answer is, if you hang out with Matas Miller, you go places. So <laughs> here I am. We made it. Baruch Hashem. Okay. Uh, so you have a lot quickly. to offer in yourself, and I think we're going to see that this evening. So. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about OCD, and I think Matas um, is going to talk uh, a little bit more about general anxiety. So what is OCD, um, how is it being exacerbated today, and uh, what are we doing about it? Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about this as we go through the night, but just to give you a quick little 
um, a bit of information. OCD Matthew, is, just, sorry, if you could just stay like still, sorry. I'm getting oh, you want to stay still? I'm getting a little anxiety, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different diagnosis, but I'm not going to go into that now. Um, OK, so OCD, as we know, uh, stands for uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessions would be reoccurring persistent thoughts, urges, impulses, um, et cetera, intrusive. And these things are intrusive, they're unwanted, um, and it causes a lot of anxiety for people. Um, what people try to do when they get these obsessions is they try to ignore them. They try to suppress them. Um, they try to neutralize it with another thought. Obviously, these things don't work. Um, compulsions would already be the things that people do, the actual actions that people do. Um, so that would be like repetitive behaviors, the repetitive hand washing, um, checking, constant checking, you know, the person who checks again and again to see if the stove is off, that the door is locked, um, et cetera. Um, doing things to try to prevent some kind of dreaded uh, situation. If the oven's not off, how do I know if it's off? How do I know if I unplug the, uh, the toaster? We go back and check repetitively. Otherwise, we have these images of our house going up in flames, constantly showing us something like that. And we keep doing these things to try to neutralize the anxiety. So basically, um, OCD is under the umbrella of anxiety. Anxiety basically um, is basically the root of it is not wanting to experience uncertainty, but obviously I'm making it very simple. We'll be going to a lot more um, as we go along. Um, and when we don't want to experience the uncertainty, so we're trying to do all kinds of things to get that certainty. Um, and what that does is, yes, it gives us certainty for a couple of minutes until the anxiety shows up again. So what do we do? So of course in therapy, um, and people can do this on their own as well, what you can do is you can not give in to your obsessions, not give in to your compulsions and purposely do exactly what your OCD does not want you to do. It's obviously a lot simpler said than done and it takes a little more instruction, but that's the basic idea. Um, now, basically, and if, if you look in the, um, uh, the DSM, um, a person has OCD if he spends about an hour a day um, on these obsessions and compulsions. But we have to understand that many of us, um, even though we can't, we're not, we can't be diagnosed as having OCD, but we can be anywhere on the spectrum, all right? So we can have a lot of it, a little bit of it, um, and it depends on what's going on at that particular time. Now, if you go to a time like this, all right, where there's a pandemic, Baruch Hashem seems to be winding down, but we just went through um, something really rough, and we've been warned millions of times to wash our hands and wear gloves and wear masks and all that stuff. Um, what's that going to do? Obviously, that's going to re reawaken the whole thing and just exacerbate it. In addition, what we're doing now is we're adding anxiety to anxiety. And what do you think you're going to get? Even more anxiety. So that's part of what's going on. Um, I recently got a meme that said like this. My, o my therapist says the following. Your OCD is irrational. Um, the government says you must, wa you must wash your hands 19 times a day or your dad will die. So how do we figure this out, right? If my OCD is irrational, but now I'm being told I have to constantly wash my hands. So what are we going to do? Um, so just to get into that a little bit, what we want to do is for those people who are experiencing this and they're washing their hands constantly and they're getting into all kinds of stuff. And uh, Asher, do me a favor. If I'm getting, uh, if I'm going too long, please uh, shoot me a text or just- You're doing great. You know, doing great. Through, uh, through the screen. Um, I'm gonna go wash my hands. <laughs> right, so what are we doing? So basically what we want to do is, is we want to follow the guidelines, but we don't want to do any more than what the guidelines are. Okay, so if we're finding ourselves doing more because we're uncomfortable and we're, we're anxious, okay, and we're trying to do more than what we need to be doing because we want to get that feeling of certainty, then we know we're doing something wrong. Okay, so if I'm calling in a company to disinfect my house, right, to decon my house, and then a week later I call them in again, all right, obviously that's ridiculous, and we have to understand that there's no way to eradicate this fully in any case, right? It's coming in. People are walking in and out of the house, you know, so... We don't have full control over this in any case, so the best we can do is follow the CDC guidelines and not try to do any more than that, um, and specifically try not to do any more than that. Um, the, the, the point is to, ch and, and this is the big deal with OCD in general, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, okay? We have to allow, basically, when we don't give in to our OCD, what happens? 
we become uncomfortable, we become anxious. Well, we have to allow that anxiety to be there. We have to allow that discomfort and that uncertainty to be there. And that's the point. Um, and we have to become uncomfortable. Uh, I'm sorry, we have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. The more we feed it, the more we try to get that certainty, um, the more we're just feeding the monster and the more it grows. So with that, I'm going to throw this back to you, Usher. Okay. Program is on the moderator side. Um, let me mute. Where's the noise coming from? Okay. I'm going to mute for a second. Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions people want to ask live, uh, guys. Um, there's a lot of live questions. So let's try to speed up a little bit the answers and move a little quicker. Um, I just want to usher maybe throw in. I'm thinking like this and tell me what your thoughts are. Um, maybe I should bridge over and talk a little bit more about the anxiety, some other aspects of anxiety. And then let's open it up for questions. So this way Menachem and I can both. Right. Respond. Does that work? Try the poll now or after you? Your call. Um, I, I think let's jump in. Let me speak a little bit and then we'll take some questions and we'll share. Okay. Um, thank you, Menachem. That was excellent. And there's a reason why everyone's here for you too. So thank you. Um, so I just want to give, a, you know, I know we gave all those thank yous, but uh, to Usher, who was persistent to make this happen, to Coach Menachem, sh uh, shout out to my uh, good friend Shalom Stein for sponsoring tonight. And, you know, Usher and Menachem for putting out this, this wonderful platform. And it's truly incredible to see the tremendous chesed. You know, so many individuals just, I mean, every night there's something else. Um, and to see, you know, doing something a little di different that clearly people are responding. There are a lot of people on tonight. Um, and it's, it's I'm, I'm glad I'm here. So thank you for that little push to get here. And, uh, um, you know, talking a little bit about anxiety, which a lot of us have. Um, you know, I'm going to Menachem's point, uh, you know, again, as he gave such a good opening to OCD, we also know about OCD is that when there is just anxiety in general, uh, that causes an increase, an uptick in our symptoms of, of OCD as well. So this is certainly a time that even if your OCD was not active, OCD naturally, we know it waxes and wanes, it comes and goes. Um, and when there's a time of higher levels of stress, anxiety, uh, emotions love themselves. Um, emotions breed emotions. So during a time like this, you know, many of us can see some more OCD or some of us who've never seen some OCD can have some OCD-like behaviors, um, including myself. So all of us in a way, you know, are experiencing some compulsiveness and not sure exactly what is that guideline. And I'm sure those questions are lining up like, well, how do I know? And what if, and is this the right guideline? Is that the, you know, CDC is political. This is all about, you know, you know, but I heard this story and I heard that story. So we'll certainly get into that. Um, and I'm sure there's some great questions. I just want to, you know, as we go into that, I want to give a little bit about anxiety, maybe a couple of strategies, and then just really open this up for all types of anxiety and certainly uh, to OCD as well. Um, so as we talked about anxiety and anxiety underlying, you know, OCD, which is, um, you know, classified as an anxiety disorder, you know, as mentioned, you know, some might be familiar, you know, it used to be a subset of anxiety. Now it's an own class of OCD related disorders. Um, but the difference is because OCD is more what we know is related to executive functioning versus emotional processing. So uh, a lot of OCD is related to a, an inflexibility in thinking, a cognitive inflexibility in terms of our executive functioning. Um, we get stuck on certain thoughts. We can't let go of those thoughts as opposed to other anxiety disorders like uh, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, things like that. Um, are related to emotional processing. Um, anxiety is necessary for survival. We need it to function. You know, Hashem created everything with, you know, the more and more you understand it and get to the depth of it, we see its importance. He created us with an internal alarm system that's so important. And this alarm sends emotional and physiological responses throughout our body. Many of us know there's the fight, flight, freeze response it prepares us for danger. Um, it leads us to success. And part of that system that activates, that sympathetic system, that arousal system, it's really incredible. I mean, if you truly study it, our heart rate increases, our eyes dilate, our blood pressure increases. We have bursts of adrenaline and energy throughout our body. I mean, have you ever been really anxious and hungry at the same time? Yes, I know you eat when you're anxious, but often it's not because you're usually hungry. Your digestive tract actually slows down. So there's so many things that are going on 
in your body to prepare you for that fight, flight, or freeze response to be able to deal with anxiety. Um, you know, even tonight, you know, I was going through the day and then, you know, I'm starting to get uh, ushers like shooting me like email after email, like, okay, it's going viral here, it's going viral here. So I'm like, okay, maybe I should prepare for this a little bit, you know, just I started to feel some of that emotion, you know, maybe I should get my thoughts together, you know, I was just, so that anxiety prepares us, it helps us improve our functioning. But think about now, think about where, you know, those who aren't anxious, who are just walking around, you know, um, and I'm not judging anyone, but perhaps someone in the onset, ah, this is not true, it's not real, they're not vigilant, they're not checking. Um, and as a result of that, um, that could have led to, um, you know, uh, illness and, and other consequences. So that anxiety, again, is really, really important. Um, the problems we know about anxiety is, is that it can have the opposite effect. And as it increases, it then can start to actually impair our functioning if it's too much anxiety. So, and when that happens, that's where, as we said, the OCD, but sleep, focus, concentration, irritability, racing thoughts, images, panic, worry, obsessions, I'm getting anxious thinking about all this, um, can lead to this like downturn in your mood and lead to hopelessness and feeling stuck. Um, and that's, that's really where it becomes problematic. So we don't wanna get rid of anxiety. Um, yes, yeah, certain aspects of OCD we wanna get rid of, um, but anxiety overall, we want to regulate those emotions. And I think it's really important um, to think not like all oh, your anxiety is not bad. You don't want to get rid of it all. I and mean, then it's important, but you want to learn how to regulate some of that. And often the problematic anxiety, as we know it, is set off by a false I alarm. I talked about this alarm system. There's a false alarm. You know, it's like, you remember you were in the classroom and the, the fire drill went off and you knew it was a false alarm. Uh, but sometimes you didn't know when you reacted like this was dangerous but it wasn't really dangerous. So sometimes we have these thoughts or emotions and we tend to catastrophize or predict that there's gonna be some disaster or predict the future, or we're hypervigilant for threat, or we have a fear that we're gonna lose control. Um, and therefore that, that's where a lot of this becomes problematic in terms of our anxiety, where we have these certain perceptions of danger and then that whole arousal system that I talked about, that sympathetic system is all activated and then we get more and more anxious or stressed and overwhelmed. The difficulty is everyone's gonna ask, but there is a real threat, right? There is a danger here. Um, so what's going on, you know? So how, how can we cope? I mean, and then the anxiety is taking us over. So that's what I was saying before is that we really have to find that balance of knowing when, when our anxiety is a result of an overestimation of threat or danger, we need to assess and understand what our reaction is. And if it is truly a danger or there is a threat, then we need to figure out resources to build our resilience or respond effectively if there is really an accurate danger or there really is a problem. Um, and we'll certainly talk a lot about that tonight. I'm sure a lot of questions will come. So how do most of us cope with anxiety uh, and respond? So many of you are going to say, oh, I just get myself, I, I get busy. I distract myself. Um, I just, we talked about the suppression, we push it away. No one likes to be uncomfortable, as Menachem said. We just don't wanna feel, and anxiety does not feel comfortable. And actually, it could be quite painful. It could be more painful than physical feelings as well. And it can be scary for many. People have a fear of, as I said, loss of control, or that they're gonna go crazy, or they're gonna have a nervous breakdown when stress gets really high. Actually, worry, which is interesting, the research, Worry is a form of distraction. When we actually worry about things, it, it's a way of us not focusing on what we're feeling. So as we keep ourselves worrying about all the possibilities, we're not experiencing what we're feeling, another form of distraction. But as Menachem said, and we'll talk about this more, is it doesn't work. So why do we do it? Because it does work in the short term. So if you could imagine, it's like if you build a, uh, a wall of sand by the ocean, it's going to block some of the water, right? But eventually the water is going to seep back through. Or if you're in a hole and you want to get out and, and you try to get out by digging further, you're going to get more and more stuck. So trying to push away is not going to be effective. So what are some strategies for anxiety? I'm just going to go through a few, but I'd rather open up to questions and then 
Um, but I'm just going to throw out a few concepts. It might sound like a lot. Um, if anyone wants to hear more about that or it's related to them, shoot that. But basically, I'm not going to, I don't think we're going to get too much in tonight. There's been a lot of talks about this, about decreasing our vulnerability, our likelihood for emotion during these difficult times with people talked about, which is super important, balanced eating, schedule, sleep, exercise, relaxation, meaningful activities, positivity, gratitude, all those things build resilience and help you cope. Um, in terms of the anxiety itself, one thing is, as I talked about a little bit, and this is basic cognitive therapy, is really understanding the errors in our thinking. But errors doesn't necessarily mean distortion, as I said, is a lot of your thoughts about threat and danger might be accurate, but the question is, are they helpful? Do they fit you with your values? Are they important? And I think that's really important. So even if it's a distorted thought, it's not, but then I, I can't stop myself from thinking about it. I try to stop, I try to stop, and we'll get more into that, of course. Um, and then uh, there's ideas that we can actually let go of worry by using a concept called worry time, where we leave worries for the end of the day because it distracts us. Um, there is exposure, which Menachem talked, which is more behavioral. There's ways to learn how to be uncomfortable with uncertainty so that we can experience anxiety. There's using concepts of being present in the moment because so often we're in the future, bringing ourselves as a mindfulness concept and taking each step as we go to get more grounded so we don't get overwhelmed with anxiety. And of course, learning to experience our emotions. And, and this is a, a theme I think we'll get through it a lot, hopefully tonight. Um, I'm gonna move on from this to questions. There's a lot more other uh, strategies, but this piece I just wanna expand on a little bit is we don't want to feel our emotions. And as soon as we're aware of our anxiety, as I said, we've been talking about, we naturally want to get rid of anxiety because it makes us feel better. And if I'd say, sit there and feel your emotions, say, why in the world would I do that? Because actually there's a paradoxical effect. When I start to feel my emotions, the physical sensations, the anxiety, guess what happens? Initially, when I come in contact with it, it does increase and it will go up, but eventually it will come down because emotions don't last forever. And if I continuously do that and I get more comfortable with experiencing emotion and I label emotion and I just say, this is my anxiety, it's coming and going and noticing it come and fall and observe it, it actually over time will help me regulate the emotion more effectively. And that's something we could discuss further. So it's just a little overview about anxiety, some different techniques and strategies um, and um, talked a little about the OCD. So Usher, let's open up for some questions and let's get right to it. Yeah, everybody's like texting me over here. I can barely listen to the speech. It's like, okay, everybody, everybody has their questions. I'm like, guys, if you don't ask the question, then how are you gonna know if you have anxiety? Okay, so guys, whoever could open up their cameras, let's 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 be interactive. Uh, obviously, if you could, if you feel comfortable. If not, if not, uh, anybody wants to ask questions, please text me. Um, it's uh, questions here. That's the questions. Um, we have a bunch of questions here. I would like to first start off with something interesting. Let's see if it works. We're going to take a poll. Of course, the poll is anonymous. So nobody knows who said what. But just to get a general concept, there's going to be two questions. Choose which is your answer, just to get a little uh, feeling of it, okay? Here we go. First question is, I'm going to read it before I post it. I feel anxious and worried. A, okay, now let, me, let, me, let me launch it, and then we'll do it. Is it on the computer? Yes. Okay, the first question is, I feel anxious and worried. Choose either A, all the time, B, once in a while, or C, I'm not anxious at all. It's question one. Everybody can answer. It's anonymous. I don't know who's saying what. Question number two. Do you see change in your child's behavior in the last five weeks? Yes, no, I'm not sure. Five seconds. Wow. That's really wow. incredible. This is interesting. Wow. All right. Everybody's done? Here we go. Yep. People are still going, okay, wait. That's it, done, come on. I can't wait forever. Matt, is you ready to see the results? Yes, I do. Seems like there's no reason why anybody's here tonight. Everybody has no anxiety. Now nah, I'm just joking. Here's the results. Yeah. Everybody see the results? 21% of people here tonight feel all the time anxiety. 58% of the people once in a while feel anxiety. 21% of the people came here just to see you, Matt, because they love you. No yeah. other reason. Yeah. Uh, that's why I came. <laughs> and number two, do you see a change in your child's behavior? 42% said yes. So it's obviously, there's no question. I mean, I'm shocked anybody's saying no. I, I hear it. 
but um, it's amazing. 42% said yes, 31% no, 27% not sure. I think, that, I think that's amazing to see. So uh, I just thought that was interesting to put it out there. Okay, let's start with some questions. Uh, I'm going to try to hurry it up. You know, guys like, you know, answers. I'm going to throw it out to the therapist. And um, Matis, Mr. Friedman, Bulls in your court, you're the you're professionals. Coach Menachem, you're here. You coach us through it, okay? First question, I'm going to ask Mr. Kranz to ask a live question. Is that okay? Let's unmute him. You have anxiety? Just want to make sure you don't have anxiety. Some exposure, guys. Let's do this. Let's go. Hi. Um, I have a question. It's not so much about myself, Baruch Hashem, but how do you manage living with someone that has that much anxiety that they're not themselves? Like, you're okay, you're doing your thing, coronavirus is terrible and it's scary, but you just, you don't have anxiety about it because of that's not something, that's not something you have. But people that you know are going out of their minds and how are you supposed to, like, is there something you could say to them? Is there a way how you're able to deal with them? That's the question. You want to grab that, or you want me to jump in? I'll give it to you. I, I'll start, and um, you'll fill in the you'll fill in the you'll fill in the uh, what I'm missing. I, so basically, um, if we're living with someone who has anxiety, the worst thing we can do is try to rationalize with them and say like, "What are you so afraid of? Come on, like, what? what what's the problem?" And they, what we do that first of all, it's tremendous invalidation, which only makes it worse and makes the person feel worse. Um, and B, you're not helping anything. Um, anxiety is not a rational thing, so you can't rationalize yourself out of it. Um, so the first thing that you need to do is to just understand where that person's coming from. This is not something that they really have control over, um, especially if they don't have the skills to deal with it. Um, and you're, you're going to have to just show them that I get it, that you're terrified, um, and uh, it's hard for me to watch this. And I, I feel terrible. And you have to validate that. You do have to validate that. And if you can um, find the skills to help them, then that would be awesome. But you got to validate. Matis. Yeah, no, that's that's the number one point. Um, I'm with you on that. Um, because making light of um, or giving a response is just going to you know, make them feel like they are crazy. Because as it is, they're feeling pretty crazy and overwhelmed. So when you're just very, very relaxed, um, you know, it just reconfirms in their mind that clearly there's something really wrong with me. You know, it's the same idea I was saying before about making space for anxiety. Just like the person who has anxiety needs to make space, a person who's living with someone also has to make space for anxiety. Um, and I think that that can be really, really powerful and supportive for the person. It's a very tricky balance because, you know, on the one end, you don't want to provide too much reassurance, a constant reassurance, because that could be unhelpful. It's like feeding the anxiety again, you know, talking about OCD, for example, let's say the person says like, are, are we going to be okay? Is everything going to be okay? And you say, you know, sure, sure. It's going to be totally fine. Don't worry about it. But, you know, it, there's nothing really to worry about. It's getting better or whatever it might be, you know, and then 10 minutes later, you know, the worry comes back to them. The obsession comes back and then they come back to you again and they bring it up again. Um, so it's really important not to you know, to provide some reassurance, but when we, that, that can actually feed their anxiety and, and keep it going. Um, the other thing is, is um, I, I think it's helpful to, to learn about anxiety and understand. Um, I think it's also so you can be more empathetic. I think you should ask that person, you know, what you could do for them um, to be helpful, to be supportive. You know, if they are overwhelmed or they are stressed, um, you know, don't try to get rid of it again. As I said, anxiety has a function. It's an alarm system. Sometimes even just helping them talk it out or label it or acknowledge it in and its, in and of itself can help them feel a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more understood, a little bit normalized. And that will help the emotion pass. That, that is a transactional process that can be very, very helpful in coping with someone with anxiety. Um, and one standard... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, go, go. Please. I think one standard line, we use this a lot in therapy, and that is um, just because it seems so real doesn't mean that it is real. And you can say that. I know it seems very real and it seems very, very scary, but it's not necessarily as bad as you think it is. You know, that scariness, that's your, your brain is tricking you into thinking all kinds of terrifying things. And we call that emotional reasoning. Something feels very real, therefore we take it seriously and we go with it. 
but it's important to know just because it feels so real doesn't mean that it is. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, that, that is important. And it's, again, it's that balance because we also don't want to start to play therapist um, because the person we live in doesn't want us to have that role of therapist. And the truth is a therapist, when we're addressing anxiety, we really don't go too much into what we call like a lecture mode. We don't start explaining to them that they're distorted and their anxiety doesn't make sense. It's a process that we help them on their own to come to that conclusion. So they have an understanding on their own because, and that, that can help them, um, you know, learn the skills and be more effective in, in regulating their anxiety. Um, did that answer your question, uh, Daniel? Was that Daniel? No, I can't unmute him. Very much so, thanks. Thank you so much, yes. Okay, my pleasure. All right, we're ready to keep on going here? Let's shoot. Matt, does you not falling asleep, right? <laughs> not yet. It's all almost, right. It's almost my bedtime. Just a little, little more. Coach Menachem's brother on, and he wants to ask a question, so we're going to put him on. Ramotcha. Yes, hi, how are you? Thank you, uh, both Menachem's and uh, Matt's mother. Uh, my question is a little bit um, on the reverse end. You know, uh, when this whole um, uh, Corona COVID uh, came upon us, uh, my anxiety kicked in and then before, you know, many people were taking this seriously, <clears throat> you know, I was sounding alarms as Matis uh, says, anxiety is an alarm. And um, I was people, uh, telling people in my in network of people that I know that this is real and it's coming and it's coming full force on us and we've got to take this seriously and people were laughing at me. Um, but, but as things, you know, uh, time have passed and things are getting better. Um, you know, Menachem Friedman was saying that a little bit that we have to follow um, the CDC uh, versus uh, OCD. Um, you know, we were, all the Rabban was, were telling us all along that uh, we have to, our nefesh, we have to take things a little more serious and do a little more than the CDC guidelines, you know, Minyanim and, and social distancing. We were doing, uh, we were taking it to, to an extreme to put a uh, screeching halt on this. Um, but th as things are getting better, um, I'm afraid that the, 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 you know, the OCD that maybe I've never experienced or the anxiety is, is starting to lax and we're getting back to normal and we're feeling like, you know, this is, we're getting over it and we don't, we can stop washing our hands and, um, and stop uh, social distancing. It's a little bit on the opposite end. The, the, the OCD and anxiety, anxiety is like falling apart. And um, is that something wrong? Is that, do we need the, to, to get that little OCD? Do we need to have the balance, the little anxiety to remember that we're still in this pandemic? Um, you know, how to balance that and how to juggle that. It's your brother. <laughs> okay. I see my brother's on. He's going to come at me next. So, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I could I could respond, Nachum, if you want. Or... I could I could just say uh, one or two words, and he'll take it over. I I really believe that it's a good indicator to see if you have the right balance or not, because some people, I I believe, and tell me if I'm right, because their OCD kicked in in the beginning they did not take it seriously because it was too hard for them to all the stress and worry so it's much easier for, for them to say whatever they go to a movie talking right away and they let everything go which i think could be is, is also not right so to find out if you were doing the right thing in the beginning is now is a good indicator because we still have to follow the same way we followed in the beginning, not because of our OCD and not because of our own worries, it's because we, we try to do the right thing. And that's what they told us to do then. And now let's see what they tell us to do now. But in, sometimes when it goes uh, extreme in, of each, either way, sometimes it could show that it's a little bit uh, not following the CDC, it's more their own our own uh, stress, own worries. That's uh, the way I see it. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. You know, from my perspective, I, not, I don't see it exactly like that. I, what I think is, it's, it's a, really a multiplicity of factors, I think, that are, that are causing that to happen. 
Um, you know, certainly I, I see with people who have really high levels of anxiety and they're going out of their house and they're seeing like the social distancing just disappearing, um, they're getting even more anxious. Um, you know, I'm finding that with a lot of people um, because they're, they're naturally more hypervigilant and their emotions are still, they're sensitive and their emotions are still pretty high. So it becomes really overwhelming when they go down and they have the mask and the guy walks in the, gro the grocery without the mask or just social distancing doesn't apply to me. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons why, why, you know, it's just, there is only so long um, for some people who don't have, you see, what really drives a lot of the consistency of the behavior is the emotion of anxiety, as we talked about. For those who don't have much levels of anxiety or are more careless or, you know, they just find excuses or they're just getting cooped up in their home, I think it's more of like, okay, we did this, we've done that, you know, now it becomes about President Trump and the Democrats, you know, or something like that, you know, and, and therefore, or okay, you know, we all had it already. Okay, so the doctors say it's possible that, like, there's no end game here. So, you know, they have a lot of thoughts that are going in their mind that are leading to a decreased level of anxiety and a desire to move on. Um, I think, which I think is a mixture of emotion, I also is personality. Um, I think some people are just, you know, by nature uh, that way and, and, and less sensitive. So, um, you know, then, then the question is, it's not about, it's not about wrong or right. It's, it's what about what is. And I think we each have to, I mean, this is a broader discussion, but I, I think we each have to really look at ourselves and try to do for ourselves what's most effective for ourselves, for our families, for our children. I think if we're going to be looking at everyone else um, and worried about everyone else, um, it, it's not, it's just going to lead to judgment and frustration and, you know, feeling isolated or different, um, rather than being understanding that, you know what, you know, this is obviously hard for them or they had enough or they have their belief system. I can't change the world. Um, but you know, I am following those guidelines and I don't think it's an OCD. I think it's consistent with whatever those guidelines is. I mean, my perspective is in general, I say like, you know, it, it could be the government has no idea what they're talking about. It could be the CDC is totally off and the person who's running it, you know, has some, you know, agenda. I don't know. But what I don't have what to follow. Is it that? I'm sorry? The Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know the answer to that. There's an uncertainty there. But I need a baseline and I need to follow. And that's why we have Rob Bottom and that's why we have Gedalim and that's why we have doctors and medical professionals. You know, I, as I've told my children, like, I said, you know, well, you know, if tomorrow they open school, my kids are going to school. Now, how could it be that tomorrow they're going to school, but today I told them they have to be six feet apart? That makes no sense. It doesn't, right? But I, I think what there has to be a baseline of some sort of protocol. I think what you're seeing right now is also it's, it's probably a process of habituation, normalization, desensitization. People are exposed so much to this new normal, or they're like, if I didn't get it, right? We're talking about threat, you know, going back to our discussion. If I believed in the beginning, I was obsessive because I, or I was anxious because I saw some threat, it's been eight weeks, you know, and maybe I haven't gotten sick or I've seen the people around me got sick, but they got better. Or I, I don't know what they're all talking about or I'm not exposed to, to other information. Or, so that's just going to lead people to go back to a certain path. So I, I think it's a lot of pieces. I'm going to just summarize. I think part of it is, nature, personality. I think part of it is just, there are those who are more, more emotionally sensitive or more anxious. Um, I think part of it is that people are just, you know, just had enough and, you know, and they don't see any threat. So they're responding to not having a threat. Amazing. Mathis, we have so many questions. Uh, you're not going to sleep tonight, is that okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, let's try to speed it up as much as possible because I really, not, not, not for you, Mathis, but really just so many people that have so many questions and people are coming from all angles here. So let's try to do it. I'm actually going to jump in. There's a few people online, but I'm going to jump in because this question is, came to me times and I want to really, I, I relate to it. It's not my question. It's not my kids. Kids, please forgive me. It's not mine. Ready? My teenager, 17-year-old boy, is not managing with the situation. Every time I tell him to be careful, wash his hands, he blows it. He claims I'm the crazy one. He goes out and he doesn't care about anything. When the family talks about the virus, he runs out of the room. How do I deal with it? No. Uh, 
I can take, <laughs> I can take the question if you're not. Yeah. I think um, I think I'm seeing some of the same thing in my own house. When I say wash your hands, I get a lot of rolling eyes. Um, look, there are some things that are within our control and some things that are not within our control. Um, and uh, there, there's a balance there. We do have to sit down sometimes with some of our kids and say, look, here's the situation. I understand that you had enough of this. I understand that you think this is overkill. But here's what's going on, here's the data, and here's what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and then you can do your best. And then at times you just have to accept that my kid is not gonna wash his or her hands, and um, there's gonna be some non-social distancing going on when I'm not looking, okay? Today I pulled up to the front of my house and suddenly my daughter and her friend like uh, uh, magically moved uh, several feet apart. Was and it my daughter? Was it my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> it may have been. And that's just something you have to accept. And yes, there's a certain degree of anxiety there as well. And you just have to go with it because some things are really not within our control. Because even if I sat on top of them 24-7, okay, first of all, I can't do that. But even if I, if I did as much as I was able to, I still can't stop them from doing all the things that they're going to do. And I still can't make them wash their hands as many times as I would like them to. So there's a certain, a certain amount of acceptance that has to be there while we're trying to be normal. So there's, there's, there's a balance there. Matis. Uh, yeah, I want to around, Matis, before you answer that. One, one, one more point to that, and you're, you're running there. Just in terms of the, just a nice strategy, in terms of the control, is that when a lot of the things that we're worrying about or we're thinking about or we're focusing on are things that we cannot control. And I think that might be something that refocus your attention and even make a, a circle of things that are in my control and things outside my control. And actually refocus your attention. When you notice you're getting stuck on some idea that's not in your control, refocus on things in your life that are in control and focus on that because the other area is just gonna to lead to more anxiety and ineffectiveness. Go ahead, Usher, I'm sorry. I'm looking at, I'm looking at a question I got, it's exactly the opposite. So I wanna hear the, the flip side of the coin. My seven-year-old daughter sits with the Hillam for almost every hour of the day. She did, never did this before. She's talking less. I could, tell she, I could tell it's on her thoughts all the day. How do I deal with that? It's the opposite flip. Yeah. Um, I mean, cl clearly, I, I shouldn't say clearly, but I, I, I would imagine most of us understand that's unhealthy behavior. I can't tell you absolutely it's unhealthy behavior. It depends on the child, depends on their personality, it depends on their previous behaviors. Like you're saying, if there's some changes in behavior, um, it also depends on the culture, it depends on the house, it depends on what the mother does. Is this how we grow up? Is this how we focus? I mean, there's so many pieces there. But if there's like this change like that, and suddenly the child stops talking and, and is, you know, they're, they're probably once again is, is going back to the OCD is a compulsion, compulsion of some sort. You might not realize or a distraction. As long as I say my capital to Hillam, as long as I focus on, you know, davening and, and getting close to Hashem, then I'm safe. Then the world's going to be okay. If what does I the mother do about? It? What does the mother huh? do about? It? What does the mother do with the kid? Okay. So I, I think the mother has to sit down with the child um, and explain to them that you know help them define what what is okay. You know to first of all say that you know the, saying to Hillam for so long you know this is not what Hashem wants if you know going that route or explain to him doing that too much. You know you could you don't have to be doing this all day. And then and, and have, a, have a discussion with the child, see how, how the child responds. So, well, but then something bad's gonna happen, you know, and then you can sort of teach them is that just because you have that thought something bad's gonna happen, you know, I don't, I'm not saying to him all day and, you know, nothing bad happened, you know, helping them understand that. But I think defining for them, you know, let's make a certain hour that you say to him. And then I want you to do some other things in your day. You know, this is a really job of a parent to teach the child what's healthy behavior during a time like this. You know, the child doesn't know, you know, I want you to have, I want you to get out for an hour a day. I want you to do some exercise. I want you to call your friends. I want you to have a Zoom chat. Um, I want you to go with Coach Menachem. You know, maybe he can give you some tips. I, I, want, to, I want to hear Coach Menachem's take on the question, Matas. What will you do? Seven-year-old kid, you see him, he's acting saying to him all day. He's taking it to the other extreme. Um, what do you do? How do you deal with that? Matas said, Matas said it all. <laughs> okay. But the, the important piece that I'm hearing is that the parents should be able to sit down and listen what's going on in the child's head. That, that's, that's a challenge. Be able to sit down there and let the child talk. 
and then don't knock the child when he says, but this, but that, no, no, no. Just sit there, listen, let it come out, so you know what you're dealing with. Menachem, we said this last, uh, we said this um, last time, I find math is very interesting uh, that, that we're home. We should have so much time with each kid. I personally find I have less time now than when I work all day and I come home at night. So it's, what you're saying is that even harder to do now. That's my personal, you know, professional opinion, you know, with my master's degree. Okay, let's move. Guys, there's so much going here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump now to somebody's relative. You know, the relatives are the ones that are into it. But after that, we have, we have the lineup. All right, let's go. Let's go, Chaya. Oh, okay, so I have three comments just before my, because I'm also kind of want to jump on what Menachem is saying. But basically, Menachem, you were saying about validating. I hope that's okay. Just I think it would pertain to everybody. Um, validating, you know, your spouse or your child who's highly anxious instead of jumping right away to try to fix the situation. But I think that what we would need then is for people. Uh, to if that I can jump in for one second, this is. Uh, this happens to be my sister. She's a rock star Hi. therapist from Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> so just so we know. Practicing who we're talking pretty to. much in the same style as, as Matis and Emanathan. So <laughs> and talking to my soul. By um, the way, so in this program, I just want everybody to know there, there's, there's, I said this last time, we have usually about a thousand to two thousand dollars an hour worth of therapists on this program. We have Dr. <laughs> Mordechai Weiss over here. He joins us all the time. How yeah. are you? He's there. He's Hi. there. <laughs> So, uh, so basically what I quickly just wanted to add is that we may sometimes have to um, just calm our own selves down and, and know what kind of mood we're in before we start so that we have the kayak and the strength to be able to validate this, this particular family member and calm them down. So we just have to kind of expose ourselves a little bit and be comfortable with a family member's anxiety. So that's just something that I wanted to just piggyback on. Another thing I, I was intrigued by your poll in terms of um, kids not doing well. Interestingly, I deal with a lot of children that have a lot of trouble in school. Um, and I'm talking to their moms now and I'm reevaluating, I'm just throwing it out, I'm reevaluating this whole school system because a lot of them are doing so beautifully now with the pressure being taken away. And at the same time, they're attending their Zoom classes and things like that. So it's just a subject out there, if, if Coach Menachem or whoever wants to pick this up, but I'm just letting you know, some children are not doing well, but I've been in touch with moms who are saying, oh, wow, well, can, we, can we do a do-over with, with the whole system? So that's just something else. Another thing that I just want to say in terms of social distancing and why I understand why people are so frustrated is because a lot of people, the ones who are, really following the guidelines in terms of social distancing is number one are those people who do have a higher level of anxiety but number two are those people who are in that vulnerable category who have prior conditions um, or who are over 60 and i think it's good to just talk a little bit about empathy with your children about we're not just doing this for ourselves and i know it's so frustrating but there are so many loved ones who we love and care for that could be within that vulnerable population okay so now question, so one of my questions was, and I think Mattis, you already addressed it, was this proper balance between our anxiety um, and living with uncertainty, but also a formula for, yes, you know, following guidelines, which can actually really resemble OCD-like symptoms. Um, so if there was anything that you wanted to add there, for me, you answered the question, but I was just curious if there was that exact magic formula that you had for striking the correct balance between the two. Matis, you were telling me today about Dr. Grayson. Um, yeah, I was curious about what Dr. Grayson said. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if uh, you, you're familiar, some of you, with Dr. Grayson, but he, he's yeah. one of the like, foremost you know, researchers and has a well-known book on, on, uh, on, on OCD and anxiety. And, and he's actually known. I mean, he'll get up at presentations and he'll say, I've never washed my hands after the bathroom. Um, I, I touch the toilet and then I just go throughout my day. And that's part of the, you know, the exposure therapy. And he actually said that he's washing his hands for the first time in 40 years. Um, not only that, it was so interesting. I was telling Menachem today, it was just, he actually said his perishables, his non-perishables, non he leaves out for a couple of days, you know, so that, because that's what the guidelines. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm not touching toilets and I'm washing my hands, but 
I take my perishables right in my house and eat them. Um, yeah, maybe we light sell some of them between me and you. But um, so, so yeah, it, it, it's it's really hard. And I think you know what uh, John Grayson would say is basically is follow the guidelines. Um, and and you know again, you you wash your hands before you you know before you eat and after you eat, and you're you know you're washing your hands if you're coming from outside and you're coming into your own home. You know you, you know wash your hands um, to touch your face. Uh, they say to wash your hands. It was, it was fascinating, there's been research. You know, people don't know how often they touch their faces and people touch their faces thousands of times a day and they have no idea. And what are techniques that Matt, help- Matt, The famous clip of the lady when they first started that she gave a news conference, she said everybody should watch their, you know, their, their, they shouldn't put their fingers in their eyes and their lips and that while she was saying it, she was licking her finger. Exactly, exactly. And, and so they were saying that how you can start tracking how often you're doing it and decrease the behavior. So talking about creating OCD, it's a great recipe. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think in general, I, I don't have much more to add, but mm -hmm. I think it's just finding that. But I mean, we have the same thing with halachic shadows and OCD all the time, is that people right. come to us about, you know, you know, what point, and you work very, very closely with a Rav. And, you know, there are a lot of times, I mean, we've heard Sak, you know, I know Rav David Cohen says, clearly if you have a Suffolk, if you said the first parasha, the first pasha Kriya Shema, which we know me, the Rai, so you have to repeat it. He says, no, you do not repeat it because you're a chayla and you have to go actually against and you cannot repeat Krishna, which is, you know, but we're not saying over here when it comes to pikuach nefesh, life and death, that's where it gets more complicated. You know, we're not going to say, well, don't wash your hands um, because you're right. You might come in contact with someone who's elderly or for yourself, um, you know, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have Thank you. Then just one more quick question. Then. Hi, 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 I'm going to pause you. There's somebody else that I need to put on because. Oh, okay. But thank you. Okay. Just I, the reason I'm doing it is because there's so many people that want to ask. No, that's fine. Yeah. Want, it was a wanna... medication question, but I'm, I'm sure someone else is going to ask that. Dr. Friedman on the house. So we got we got to cash them in. Right. Well, the next person is a Manal Lakewood Masifto who's referred many clients to Matis in the past, and he has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, Matis. How are you? Good. Shalom Aleichem. Who is that? Hi, Matis. How are you? Hi. Who am I speaking to? I'm sorry. Shap C. Brody. How are you? Oh, so I'm good. Baruch Hashem. How are you? Good. Baruch Hashem. How are you? Okay. Um, what an opportunity to be able to ask you a question and actually get in touch with you. <laughs> okay. You can send a check to me. I'll give you the address. <laughs> I know you don't believe in general in throwing things under the rug. My question to you is, if you see someone is suffering from OCD, anxiety, is there any risk in waiting? We all don't know when this virus is going to end. Is there any risk in telling somebody that we're going to address it, but you have to wait until this virus ends and we will deal with it? So not only I'm going to say it's not a risk, it might be recommended. And that's because a lot of what we're seeing in terms of reaction is normal reaction to a traumatic situation. So this is not based on that there were some distortion or things like that going on, that there, we, we are in a state of, of trauma. And, and therefore, a lot of these ways of acting and behaving are normal to some degree. Um, because our anxiety gets high. Yes, maybe some of those behaviors are irrational and those thought processes are rational, but you know what? What happened after 9-11? I mean, we, we have tons of research on, and, and we didn't run to do intervention. We actually had different groups. If they ran to do intervention too early, sometimes it had uh, a negative impact. Uh, of, um, it's interesting, even now, which it's, you know, for a lot of therapists, we actually, everyone's like, oh, you're, you must be like, Therapists must be so busy these days. And I think obviously those who we are treating, we're busy with those that we are treating. But if people are in crisis mode and people are not necessarily, and I think during crisis is not necessarily a time, sometimes people run to therapy too early. I, I see people often for consultations. I'm like, you know what, give this, give this some time. So I, I would say actually, if someone is just some symptoms emerged specifically now, um, I wouldn't call it under the rug. I would just say, you know, let's just observe and wait. I mean, this might just be a normal response. I mean, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is not officially diagnosed till one month after the trauma. And there's a reason for that. 
because many people are resilient and many people have uh, post-trauma symptoms and those symptoms come and go and, and they're transient. So I'm, I'm going to keep quiet because I see Ash is getting nervous there. His anxiety. Okay, is appreciate it. Okay. Okay, um, let's go. We have a lot more. Um, let's, let's turn on my, my favorite question of the night. Always ask the best question, Shopsy. Um, I'm going to do something a little different with Shopsy. Shopsy, you here? Yes. Obviously, Matis, everybody wants to ask you the question, but I want, I want to push it around a little bit, if you don't mind. Let's try to cut a question or answer as short as possible. Ask the question either to Mr. Friedman and then Coach Menachem, and if this time we'll go to Matis, and then we'll go to the next question. Okay, so I just want to say something quickly about the Telem, just a, a, a one-liner. Sure. That it could be very helpful by explaining to a child that their capital Tehillim, you know, describing and imagining with them what it did. In other words, the problem is with Tehillim, you're, 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 you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, you don't see the results, and that's where you feel like I have to keep on holding up the world. But if you mechazek them and say, you know what your capital Tehillim did, you know, you, you, that's, Abish is happy, you, you know, you accomplished the work, I and mean, that possibly could be a... Now, I, the, what I wanted to, what I wanted to uh, ask was, um, so it's interesting, Matis said something earlier, and there's not a question not directed to you, um, but the, he said something which really, like, blew my mind. He said that, um, he said that worry is not anxiety, in fact, worry is distracting from anxiety. And I always thought, you know, I don't, have, I don't have anxiety because I, I, I feel like I don't have irrational fears. Um, I, I feel like, you know, I do have, with the situation, uh, you know, a lot of symptoms that you described, you know, a heightened adrenaline and, and, and vigilance and, and, you know, focusing on seeing where the next thing is coming and what's going to happen. But I, I'm not very worried. I'm not on picture of worst case scenarios. And um, to, to build on what you were saying before, that it could, it's normal for somebody who doesn't have anxiety disorder to feel this way now. So, Really, practically, um, see, everybody, the way you're describing it, is, is experiencing anxiety, and anxiety is helpful. So not how much anxiety or how little anxiety you should have. How could you manage the anxiety that's being helpful in a way that you're able to also uh, be productive in, in other ways besides for protecting yourself and the family for the, from the virus? Would you say it was first? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I got that. The point is, how do you, how do you In other words, I, I feel that, and maybe I'm wrong, I feel that my anxiety is, is normal and it's, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's oriented to solutions. It's, it's, um, it, it's helped me and my family keep my community safe. There are different things that I, I found out because I researched it intensely and I, whatever it is, and I was able to tell people on time, whatever it is. I feel it was a good thing. The bottom line is that this anxiety is debilitating. You know, I wouldn't have thought I had anxiety if, if I didn't realize that I, I don't think I'm worrying, like, you know, picturing things that might happen bad to me or my family. If I think I'm being very rational and, you know, on top of things. And, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm living on, I'm with a lot of adrenaline and a lot of stress and, it's, it's debilitating. So right. I don't want to get rid of it because I feel like it's important for me to stay on top of things. If, if things start opening up and people don't know the right information, I, I want to be able to tell people, tell my family, tell my friends, and, you know, I want to keep a certain anxiety and I, I want it to be productive, but, it, but it, it, in many times it's been debilitating. I'm not able to get, I'm not able to be productive. I'm not able to get work done. I'm not able to, so it's, it's not irrational thoughts here. It's not, it's not trying to guide the anxiety to something productive. It's, been there, done that, but still, it's debilitating. It's still, it's overwhelming. It's a long time, and it's, and and there's there's other parts to my life that 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 are definitely suffering because of it. So, how do you manage that with without getting rid of without that 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 very helpful attitude of of of, of super vigilance? By the way, the answer is you can't get rid of anxiety. Okay, um, it's not going away. It's there. It needs to be experienced. Um, you can try to distract. There are certain things you can, you could distract. Um, you could focus on other things. Um, and at times you just have to allow those sensations and those anxious feelings to be there. Um, that's how we deal with anxiety. Now, when you get hit with anxiety, what you may want to say to yourself is, okay, I'm anxious. Is there something I need to do? All right. Is there something specific that needs to happen now? Is there a problem? Is there danger? If there is, then do it. If there isn't, then just realize, okay, 
I'm just anxious and allow that anxiety to be there. If you want to try to distract, you can do that. If you want to um, do some paced breathing, um, look it up, some breathing exercises, things like that, you can do that as well. Um, definitely to fight the anxiety will just have the opposite effect. And I'm going to throw it back, throw it over to Matis now because I know he has a lot more to say. Um, I share my other talk. Yeah. As short as possible. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting anxiety. Okay. So, <laughs> um, uh, so Shamsi, excellent question. I'm going to say like this, two, two points. There, there could be lots of points, but I'll give you two points. Firstly, I think during a time like this, as I mentioned briefly, um, where all that anxiety is, we're talking to normal is helpful. There are a lot of things in your day that will help you be able to regulate that overall stress and emotion more effectively. A simple thing is like an exercise routine. You know, doing exercise can help regulate that emotion. Making some time to scheduling some, you know, enjoyable time, a pleasurable activity, doing something different in your day. Doing things throughout your day that will decrease your vulnerability to some intense emotion. If all my days focus on taking care of this and taking care of the kids and taking care of my job today, it, it's going to be, you know, keeping your sleep patterns. So in other words, even if you're having all that emotion, th that can address your emotion. So if you focus on a lot of those other pieces, that would be helpful. The other thing, which is a little bit more complex, which I'm not sure you're experiencing here, but that I would have to say, sometimes we have a belief that I need to hold on to my emotion. I need to hold on to my anxiety. Because if I don't hold on to this anxiety, then I hear in your voice, then, then there's, a, there's a threat because then the, the loophole is going to open. So I need to keep myself anxious, which that belief might not be true. You might not well, need to hold on to your anxiety. I, I know that, I know that, um, I, I don't know if it's the emotion. I know that the vigilance that I have had produced a very positive results. So I don't know that I need to be walking around with heavy anxiety. I do know that I can't just relax and be complacent. Right. So I'm going to say like this, I'm going to give you two things for you to try. Okay. Number one is I want you to do one day anxiety, one off. Okay. Two hours anxiety, two off and do check the, see if you're less effective or more effective between the two, find a guideline and actually test out that belief that that hypervigilance is so important because perhaps it's not as important as you think it is. And there's an overestimation uh, of what you need. The other thing is I'm gonna tell you, do a pros cons. You're saying that it's effective, I need to do this, but maybe it's causing problems over the long term. So maybe short term, maybe perhaps you have that, but there are other consequences. So there are advantages of the anxiety that you're holding on to that you think you need, but there are also consequences that are affecting you negatively. And perhaps those negative uh, you know, those disadvantages are more significant than the advantages. So I would test the belief, but I would also look at the pros and cons, and, and that might be helpful. But let's move on, I guess. All right, here we go. Next one. This is a, this is going to be a doozy. This 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 might knock us out for the night. You ready, Matis? Ready, Menachem? Here we go. Are you on? Yeah, I'm on. I'm on. Okay. okay. First, first of all, one thing, Menachem, he only saved my life as a member of Hot Solo once many years ago. But I know for many many years, and I want to go back just to. Think about this. We're trying to live in a normal world. What's that pause? Menachem, do you know who you're talking to? No idea. You know who I am. I texted you before. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I believe it's Hello, we have, a live, we have a live hero on. Yeah, he is. And then the other, well, whatever, we're not getting to it now. Uh, setting aside, which I know is difficult because being Yidden and having Bitochen and Amun is one thing, but the reality is different than what we should have or shouldn't have. We're trying to live in a normal world, but it seems like everything has changed. And it's not of the better. Just to give you a list of things I experienced, I got sick with this in the middle of March and was laid up till right before Yontif, till right before Pesach. Uh, honestly, at night I'd go to sleep not knowing if I'd be up in the morning, and the morning you didn't know. Every day you're hearing names, you're seeing names. The sirens, literally, I'm in Lakewood, we're going day and night. Um, I know Menachem, we spoke about it, but he could attest to that, to start just on and on. My daughter did a good thing, said get all social media. When you're laying in bed, a few minutes I was awake because I was out of it most of the day. Actually, when I was at your house, I told your daughter to take the computer away from you so you can stop che checking Yeshiva World every five minutes and seeing B D E B D E B D E B D E Tragic Patera, Tragic Patera, Tragic Patera. Uh, the candles, the candles. Right. But Lemaisa, Lema, putting that aside for a minute, there's a list of five or six things and you put it all together. How do you function in a world? We're afraid of our health. We're afraid of our parents' health, of our family's health. 
of the kids out. And now you hear the new thing comes out, well, kids died maybe from it. They have no idea what they're talking about. There's a lack of any interaction with other people on a regular basis that we're used to in the shuls and in the streets, whatever it's going to be. That's one of the reasons we made this platform. There you go. Our children are not having the regular schooling, and our grandkids at this point, for me also, you're seeing them, how are they going to grow up in terms of chinuch, how are they going to fall behind and then go back into a normal world in terms of socialization. The friends and the families dying and the people you're acquainted with. Uh, people have simchas, they can't put up the simcha that they're waiting for, whether it be a bris, a bar mitzvah, a pidyan, a ben, a chas, they look forward to their entire life. And now you're coming, a backyard. Every single person that I've spoken to that I know went to a backyard said, oh, it's beautiful, beautiful. But afterwards they say, yeah, but I would rather not have done it. They give you the nice story how it's beautiful and it's Kadashem Shamayim, we're going to have a new initiative, but in the meantime, not one of them was happy about it. I know a friend of mine made a chasa a week ago, his daughter was miserable. And he said she's what still the, I'm the question, I'm sorry. The question is. Well, I, I think, well, if I can come in, I think, I think he's giving us an opportunity to practice. So our anxiety is all raising now. So now as it raises, this is an opportunity for us to use some strategies and skills. There you go. So here's the question. How do we minimize or eliminate panic attacks, depression, anxiety, without resorting to the age-old medication and get to some kind of calmness in our world? Great question. Ooh. I'm actually paused. I'm actually, I want to I wanna pause this for a second. I want Coach Menachem to jump in first. Give us a little ruchnius feeling to this question, please. Well, it's true. I feel this many times when we get, come to this, to this platform, which is an amazing place where the Olam can come together and discuss. And the way Usher throws in the question and he expects everyone to answer it. And like, let's go. Give us the, give us the solution right now. Instant. And it's true. There are many things, many people, and there's a lot going on. And there's nothing to talk about. It's hard. There's a lot of black holes. There is negativity. We cannot run away from it. And you're 100% right. There is that piece of it which you can't deny. 100%. However, I'm not going to go to that however so fast. Let's sit there for a minute. Isn't that exposure? Sit there. Just sit and understand that we're going through a crisis, which Hashem Yerachim, a lot of people hit much worse than others which we'll get to the positive side if it didn't hit. But for those who did hit, it, you're 100% right. So what do we do? Well, sometimes there's nowhere to run. And then you have to open up your tillum. <laughs> you know, you have to, Hashem is running the world. And uh, he wants something from us. We don't know what. And we do have to know that he loves us. But we had another, another session that he does punish but punish as an positive because he wants us to change. And we heard from last week from Rabbi Solomon that the one thing that everybody's scared of is change. Again, there is that piece that there's nowhere to run and you're right, you're 100% right. Now, there's no question that you have some blessings to count. You could count some blessings. You could I, I, sit there I, I, wherever you are. Bar Hashem, thank Hashem for just uh, Bar Hashem be a little bit healthier. Even though there's a lot going on in the world, and then there are coping mechanisms. There are certain things that you should do that we'll hear from Atlas and Matt. We're hearing the whole night, but it's not shot as we're throwing it under the rug, and we're denying what's going on. We are aware of what's going on, and it's very important to be aware of it. Because by running away and then it comes back, and back of your mind, you're saying, yeah, but you're not facing reality. The truth is reality is hard. There's nowhere to run. But we still have to come up with some ideas to be able to go on. We can't freeze. In the beginning... I, I just want to uh, interject one second. I'm not saying there's not a lot of good times and a lot of good days. It's just the balancing at the end of the day and I know I've spoken to other people, this is, uh, so many people are going through these things with these questions. And I said the same to Hillam, and I said before, when you say the to Hillam, you could explain to them where the tefillahs are going. And I know for people, and I've been in Chinuch for a long time also, that 
they still ask the question, I think was the Saba Rebbe said, you know, every, every tefill goes for someone somewhere. It doesn't resolve that it didn't help my situation the way people look at it. Right, so there is a part that you have to do, obviously, but there is, but you have to have the balance. You can't, so. your life can't stop. And you can't say till them all day, obviously. You're going to say the little that you could say and believe that it went to the right place and believe that Hashem loves you and you did it right, so now go on. I, I, I just want to just add to that. Yes, I'm, of course, a therapist. but Now um, we'll come to the therapist. We'll hear... I, I actually know. I don't want to come to therapist then. I want to come to you then. That I that I agree with you on that very strongly. I think if we look around the world and we look who we are, how we coped with so much throughout from the, the, our very existence is through Amuna and Betachan. And I think so many times we, you know, and I've talked to my wife, you know, we, while, while we're going through this, is you know, hoping that this is the Zmanagula, you know, realizing that. You know, Hashem has a plan, you know, understanding that trying to make meaning. And that is a cognitive shift that can actually help us be able to cope with these, these struggles and difficulties. I mean, look at, look at what we've been through throughout history and how do we survive? And I think that's how we survive. Um, so we have something to hold on to that's always there, that's always consistent. And I think if you look around the world, and if you want me to bring the therapy thing in, I could bring loads of research that says one of the largest biggest protective factors that is related to resilience is, is spirituality and, and having, a, having a belief in something that's, you know, that's meaningful and having your values set straight that when you're going to sleep at night, you know what you wake up in the morning, that you understand that there's, that there's a purpose and you have someone to turn to throughout this. So I'm, I'm right with you. No, I, I, I don't agree, disagree with anything you're saying, and I agree 100%. There's a, anyone who doesn't have a course at all to remind for everything that's been going on, and, the, and on the good side of it, 100%, and there's a tremendous purpose, and everything's in the world. No one's, no one's saying that. I'm just saying, but when you come to the end of the day, and you're not, fu you're not functional, or someone else is not functional with it, and these thoughts in your head, what's the way to address it? Okay, so, so you're asking if you have specific thoughts or images in your head that you're struggling with, what can I do to help myself with those thoughts? Correct. Okay, so I mean, there's, I, again, Asha, I don't, I don't know where we want to go with this here. So there, there are many, you know, you know, as Menachem said, there are breathing exercises, there's muscle relaxation techniques, there's doing exercise, there's ways of, um, you know, you know, responding to those thoughts and learn, finding more effective ways of thinking. There's ways of learning how to let go of those thoughts when your mind is getting stuck, learning how to observe those thoughts and getting some distance from them so that they don't consume you. Um, there are many techniques that are out there, therapeutic techniques that help people at the end of the day. Yes, they have, they have the Batafan and the other bunch of them, but they're struggling with their emotions. Um, and, and, you know, as we talked about just experiencing the emotion and validating the emotion and not trying to fix the emotion was one technique we talked about today. So there are, there are strategies and techniques that you can use. Um, as, uh, you know, Chai uh, Freeman just said, radical acceptance, you know, and that, I think that that's a skill that the idea of opening up your hands, literally putting your hands out on, and resting it on your lap and, and putting a little bit of a smile on your face, not a fake smile, but just being sitting there calming, you know, noticing your breath and saying, this is what it is. Um, I don't like it, I don't want it this way, but fully embracing and allowing whatever's to be, because often when we're getting irritated and agitated at the end of the day, is because we're fighting the reality, we're wishing it to, to be different, we're judging it, we're fighting it, and fighting it takes a lot of energy. But when we sort of open ourselves up to whatever it is and allowing it to be, it, it moves from suffering to pain. Pain, as we say in uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, we say pain plus a non-acceptance equals suffering, but pain plus acceptance equals pain. And yes, intense pain, but pain. So very, that's another, but there, there are loads of techniques that one can use to, to, you know, to try to help them. Um, and again, normalize it. I mean, we're just going through this now. I mean, this is, it's not over. And, and you just went through so much, I, I'm listening to you and I'm so thankful that I did not go through anything like you, you've gone through, but just listening, I would be traumatized right now. I would be hopeless. I would be depressed. I think you've got to give yourself some time. And I think in Mirza Shem, we will get out of this. And I think I would tell you in, in, in a month from now, I'm hoping you're going to feel different and more positive and you're going to get back, you know, to more, to more of yourself.
No, in Mirza Hashem. There's only Simchas coming up, Baruch Hashem. And that, I have that to look forward to. So, Baruch Hashem. My daughter's a caller. That's what I'm dealing with also now, Baruch Hashem. Which is a good aspect. Okay, Matis. Mat, I'm sorry to cut you off. Matis, um, we had an ending time of 11.30, but we have more questions. You tell me. You're in charge. Is it, is it double? Double course now, I'm not feeling any pressure. It's okay. Perfect question. Um, um, okay, we're, we're, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. Okay. Um, let's. Um, As Usher said to me when we started the program, I said, Usher, so late? I said, 11 15, I'm done. They said, Yeah, Matt, as well. See. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I have really about three or four more questions. I'm, I, I, I won't get to everybody. It's just not going to be enough time because the truth is really, I'm, I, I want to just apologize to Matt, to be quite honest. Matas, you're a very thorough guy, and your answers are very thorough. And this this forum is really a very just touching on the issues, giving a concept. Obviously, if there's deeper issues, we need to you know either seek professional help or go to the next level. So it's not it's not that I'm trying to cut you. I, you know, it's it's a very on the fly type of thing, and it's hard for a therapist, especially somebody who's trying to really be efficient, uh, to give the proper answer. But um, I, I wasn't even being efficient. But okay, <laughs> I guess it's all perspective. I hear you. Okay. Okay. So let me let me turn on over here, uh, Dr. Weiss. He said he has a question. My neighbor, Mordechai Weiss, a therapist here. Mordechai. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Thank I, you. I, I close with you. I'm not sure. We might close with you. So. Okay. So let me first ask the question, then I'll give a little bit of background to where my question is coming from. So I wanted to know if maybe Matis, he's quite an experienced therapist, if he can give us some guidance to the people who are listening when he feels it is important to seek out a therapist or when somebody thinks that they should do it on their own. I heard that uh, come up quite a bit tonight. The background to that is the moment I heard the question about a girl, a seven-year-old who's saying to hell him all day for the past couple of weeks, I actually started writing on the chat, she needs a good therapist. But then I held back. Um, you know, and then Shapsi, who came in earlier to ask a question, asked, is it called sweeping it under the rug? And Matis kind of said, well, we're just in this. We're just getting out of this. So he's a fan of giving time. So I certainly uh, agree with that. I'm wondering if he has a specific guideline so that people who are listening know if you're experiencing anxiety, OCD, if you're panicking, if you're exhibiting uh, all types of compulsions or you're seeing that in your family, when would you say, give it time? When would you say, well, this is normal. We're going through a pandemic and let's wait it out. The one thing that, that I just wanna throw out there is I don't see the point in suffering. And, and I'm wondering you know, if Matis would agree to that. Of course, I'm a therapist, so I'm a fan of therapy. But I'm wondering, you know, in my mind, if I, pe I see people are suffering, if I see somebody's in pain, it doesn't really matter to me if it's going on for a week or a month or there's, there's really a reason to explain it. But if they're reaching out for help or they're not functioning well, you know, w when would you say or why would you say, well, let's give it another three weeks and let's see what happens? I want. I just want to. I just want to add on to uh, Mr. Weiss's point. Is um, I got about seven or eight to the same question. What's that fine line? And even Coach Menachem, you could jump in over how many different emails we've gotten. Uh, and Mr. Friedman, this is a big question. And Matas, I'm going to turn it to you. Actually, I want you to answer this question. It's not an easy question. It's a fully loaded question. At what point we're talking about whether it's a child or adult? I'm nervous. Okay. I don't know what's going to be with my job. I don't know what's going to be with my mortgage payment. I don't know what's going to be with certain issues. I have, I have friends that have retail stores. They don't, they haven't made a sale in two months. They, they, they're, they're, they're holding the PPP. They don't know what's going on. They're trying. They have anxiety, but that's normal anxiety. What's the level when it's not normal anxiety? Panic. What, like, what's that fine level? What point do you say, okay, this is, this is not regular. Yeah, obviously it's not an exact line, but I, I'll try to give you some sort of guideline without being too thorough. Um, they, they, I had to do that. Um, they, this is like, I'm going to give you an answer, but I'm really not going to give you the answer. <laughs> um, it, you know, I, I think that to answer Mordechai's question, you know, Mordechai is an excellent therapist, well-trained therapist, experienced therapist. You know, it could be that if someone is suffering and they go to a therapist and one time could target the issue and address it and help the person, that's wonderful and great. But very often that's not the case. They'll sit in therapy for a number of weeks. A lot of people want it. Sometimes a person feels uncomfortable. It's a child, it's a teenager. They have to build a rapport. They have to get a connection. They, 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 they don't, tr there's difficulty with trust, um, you know, or, or it's an adult or it's their financial issue, whatever it might be, where there's practical issues or finding the right therapist. So when you say, you know, someone's suffering, get help. Yeah, you're right. If there's someone they can call who they're, they're close with, you know, if my friend calls me and say, Matis, could you help me out with this? Because they know I'm a therapist and I can help them and give them some techniques. Why not? Why suffer? 
That's number one why. And another reason is, is because part of emotion, again, is as Menachem said so clearly, if our mindset is always about fixing every emotional experience as soon as we have it, that's actually going to lead to more suffering. That was the paradox I said earlier. So if every time you have a problem and you look at his emotions as a problem, my emotion is a problem, I got to fix it, I need to run to therapy. That's, that's gonna, that can cause more problems over the long term. So sometimes that's not necessarily the effective thing. I could go on, but I'm going to stop there. There are different reasons why it might be effective. Now, as far as what the guideline is to answer that question is, you know, in general, we look at it as impaired functioning. You know, and if you're talking about a time of a pandemic where there's impaired functioning all over you, you know, this is not, there's a baseline of what norm is. We're all washing our hands. A lot of us are anxious and people who have a little bit of anxiety have a lot of bit of anxiety. Not this, my, my year old, when I say let's do an Atilas Hidayim, he goes to the bathroom and he washes his hands with soap. And this is, that's about the, not average 10 to 20 times a day. He's so cute, but it's fine, but I'm just letting you know. Right, and that's it. I would say that's so cute, it's fine. Now, if he's doing that in three months from now, and it should be over, it's not cute and fun, okay? And at that point, we have to take the cutie and we have to bring him to therapy. So, so I, you know, again, why go through all that effort of, you know, starting, I, I think your guideline should be is, Right now, we're still in it. And I think when things calm down a little bit, it, within a few weeks, three, four weeks, six weeks, you still see that people are struggling beyond the norm is a time that they may need extra help. Now, again, if you have someone who has a relationship with a therapist, I have, let's say, many people I treat over the years, and they're going through this struggle, and they want to call me, and they say, you know, you know, Matt, can you, can you review some techniques? I want some skills. Can you help me through this? I'm having a rough time. OK, no, six weeks. Obviously not, obviously not. So I, I, I think it's really depending, but if it's someone's new who's gonna start a therapy process, I would tell you that now, let's say the kid is not eating, sleeping all the time, the impaired functioning is so significant, that should really be your radar. Where you look around and you see your other children or you see neighbors and this kid is really struggling and you try to do some basic intervention, you try to talk to the child, you try to, and it's not working, and you see the child suffering to a degree of, as, as I said, they're not eating, they're not functioning, they're not talking, they're selected mute. If there's something significant like that, get help. Um, if there are thoughts of wanting to harm themselves, or, or you're just not sure, get, I've had people reach out to me now specifically with an onset of symptoms, but the parents realized like there was something more here. So to summarize, I would tell you, number one, look at impaired functioning. If it's really significant, you should think help. Number two is before you go into therapy, understand that that process is complex unless you have a therapist. And number three is do a baseline of what the norm is and try to see if, you know, as things calm down a little bit, if some, some of those symptoms are still there, then I would get some help. Amazing. Mr. Friedman. Yes, sir. What, so, point, say, what point would you say it's, it's past the fine line? You know, I, I, I'm sitting here nodding with every single word that Matis is saying. Um, and that's exactly what I would go with. Once the functioning is impaired, that's when it's time to get help now. And it's not, we, we, we can no longer say, okay, let's wait until this thing winds down because obviously there's a problem right now that needs to be dealt with. Coach Menachem. Same here. <laughs> okay, it's unanimous. You win. Guys, I'm going to wrap up the program. I do have a few more questions. It's quarter to 12 at night. I, I just want to close with a few things, and uh, I would like everybody to say something to the close. First of all, absolutely an amazing show. I enjoyed every minute of it. I, I feel less anxious right now. <laughs> so I think it helped me a little bit. Uh, we had a tremendous turnout. A lot of people were here. Mathis, Menachem, you guys rocked the house. Coach Menachem, you, you're like the Rebbe. <laughs> And uh, it's a great forum. I really appreciate everybody coming and agreeing to call Matas. It's a massive chesed. Matas Friedman, Coach Nachum, this is all chesed. Um, it's really to help people. It's the awareness. And I'm telling you, these are questions we have been getting. Manaf, Coach Nachum, how many of these questions have we getting in the last few weeks? It's unbelievable. The positive feedback and the questions. Now we're just going to send them the link to the show. They go watch it. They don't have to ask any more questions. We have it. So I just wanted to say it was an amazing show. Thank you guys for coming on. I really appreciate it. I wanted to mention everybody who's here. We have... Every week, Sunday night, 10, 15, amazing therapists. We have next week, Dr. Shimon Russell coming on. And uh, May 24th, we have Dr. Winkler coming on. And uh, a lot more, you know, signed up. I don't want to give you all the, all the major details, but we have really, really big therapists. And we're really happy that they're all willing to come and take different angles of the situation and try to really grow it. 
Um, again, I want to thank the sponsors. Uh, again, Sean Stein for sponsoring tonight's event. And I want to thank um, Mr. Hausenfeld from Lakewood Scoop for being our sponsor. I want to thank LNN, who has the biggest status in Lakewood for sponsoring us tonight. I was going to say Milmar, but no. <laughs> and I want to thank also Chaya Kaufman from Yated and Matzer. She's very much pushing this program. She's helped us many, many times, and she's nonstop uh, really trying to help. It's really a, a joint effort for many, many people. Um, and I'm going to close, and then I would like to turn it to, for first to Coach Menachem, and then Mr. Friedman, and then Matis, and let's call it a night. I'm, a little, I'm getting a little tired. I'm feeling more relaxed, maybe. Um, I just want to say uh, a bracha, first of all, to Matis, Menachem, and everybody, you guys. should be zoich from this to have tremendous success, help a lot of people. Hashem gave you guys tremendous talents. Matis, I have to be honest with you. I'm very, very, very happy you came on. This was a tremendous program. Mr. Friedman, you're a hero. You gave up the hero nights to be here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> L42. So I, I just want to give you guys, you should be zayich to have tremendous success. In one sense, I don't want anybody to you need your services, but uh, the bottom line, if people do need your services and people should reach out to you or anybody else. Um, I know Matis, I have to, I'm going to say this again off the record. If somebody needs help, somebody comes to Matis, Matis will guide the person in the right place. It's not, it's, it's not a, about himself. He, I've seen many times people come to him and he knows exactly where to send people. He is a mumcha shiva mumcha in Lakewood, and it's well known between all the therapists. I happen to have know about seven or eight therapists that text me tonight that are here that are listening just because Matis is here. Just know that. Um, and that's it. And Coach Menachem, wrap it up. Thank you very much, Osher, for making the show a success and for getting Matis and Menachem on the show. And uh, Matis, Matis, you also, Menachem, for being on the show. And everyone out there, thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, just a little summary that at the end of the day, you can't always run away from uh, what's going on. And yes, sometimes it is hard. Some people have a coping mechanism and they, they feel they're on top of the game. So they start controlling, they do this, do that, busy, 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 till they fall apart. And they don't realize they're running away from that feeling that they don't want to feel. Try it for a few minutes, sit without any technology, without doing anything, and start realizing where your thoughts go, back and forth. That's what we're running away from. So again, it is hard times. We're having a hard time. So everybody in their own matzav, everybody in their situation, which is not easy. And on the other hand, we do have blessings to count. We have to thank Hashem. We have to continue davening. And amidst Hashem, with, uh, with uh, all of our tefillahs, we'll have a Yeshua, we curve. And we should be zoicha to the real Yeshua. The Meher of Amen. Mr. Freeman. Yes, Coach Benachem. Um, it's really a, a, an incredible platform. Uh, I want to wish you a lot of continued Hatzlacha. Yes, Kayach Matis for agreeing to do this, um, for agreeing to come on. It's been a lot of um, a lot of phone calls from Moshi saying, come on, come on, just get him, just get him, just get him. Baruch Hashem Matis agreed to do it. I think Everybody grew tremendously from it. Um, Usher, I'm blown away by the way you run an operation. I mean, anything that needs to be done, you do yesterday and you do it to the, to the, the highest level possible. Um, I think it's just important for everybody to keep in mind going forward. You're anxious? Yes, we're all anxious. These are anxious times. There's nothing wrong with you. That's what's going on right now. And when you feel that vulnerable, um, if we can inject a little bit of religion here, that's when you look to Rabbi Shalim and say, you know what? This is like completely out of our hands. We are completely powerless. The politicians are, are being sage to themselves and contradicting themselves constantly. One day it's this and one day it's that and back and forth and back and forth. And it's precisely at a time like that, when we know that we have zero control, that's when our tulips are most, are most miscobbled. So just keep in mind, this is a very powerful time and um, it's, it's, a, it's an auspicious time. So let's, let, let, don't allow that to go to waste. Thank you. Matas. So first of all, Asher, thank you for pushing me on. And I, I also want to give you a big thank you for making yourself vulnerable and coming out and just talking about yourself, because I think it just normalizes for so many people that it's okay to struggle and it's okay to have emotions and it's okay to get help. Um, for someone who's so successful and running such a great uh, platform, you're not crazy, you're not nuts. You could be a normal guy who's actually quite successful and capable. Can I get that in writing? I might need it. <laughs> Give me back. Um, it's going to cost you. That's number one. Number two is 
Um, I'm a little uncomfortable, honestly, talking about anxiety. I feel like I got way too much COVID tonight. I know I, you know, we all love COVID, but I'm, I'm over a little too much. So I'm going to throw some back at Menachem Friedman just to balance it out a little bit. Uh, he has a rock star of a sister therapist, but he's also a rock star of a therapist. Um, you know, he's genuine, he's real, um, he's caring, and, uh, you know, uh, it's just an honor and a pleasure to be working with him. And I know he's very good friends with Menachem and Asher and um, that part of that whole community. So, so thank you. Um, I want to leave off with, you know, first of all, I, I am clearly a lot of people here have a lot of questions, and it seems like there were a lot more questions we didn't get to. Um, I, I see there's a need, and if there's a need in the cloud, um, I don't know, I'm sure when, or it sounds like you have a lineup, but if there would be another point uh, that people would appreciate me coming and taking some questions, um, you know, I would certainly be willing to do so, because if there's wow. a need, very well appreciated. Okay. You and Nachum Friedman. Now, now that you came on, remember I called you and I was nudging you? Now you see what I'm talking about? I, I see what you're yeah. talking about. I want to I end with one thing that I just want to say, even though it's way past my bedtime. That's why I want to come on. But, um, but with that being said, I, I, I want to say... Well, he's just agreed to come on again voluntarily because it's past his bedtime and he's just he's not there anymore. <laughs> I'm not there. I'm foggy brain. Brain. to this. Foggy brain. I mean, Nachum knows, you know, brain fries at, at 11. Okay, but I want to say this. You can have all the skills, you can have all the knowledge, you can have all the technique. This is hard. You know, I love, you know, you go on and people say, you know, just write a structure for your kids and have this time with them and that time. Find the time to write the chart and make the structure and organize it. And, you know, even, even myself, I'm getting overwhelmed and emotional and anxious. And this, you have to understand we're learning a lot here, but it's not easy to implement. And these are difficult times. And yes, we all have emotions and we all struggle and it's normal. So I just, you know, just let's all know that we're human and this is hard and validate that. And just because we talk about all these great ideas and techniques doesn't mean you're going to leave here tonight and be able to implement that. But at least leave the here tonight and say that it's understandable to have anxiety. It's normal and there is help. And thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope to see everybody next week. Good night. Matis. Laila Toyev. Good night.